not done. Okay, I think we'll start, if that's okay. Um, Welcome to everybody. I'm Sandy Gale of New York State Assemblywoman, and uh, we have a virtual town hall this evening uh, to talk about energy savings, ways that we can be involved in, in uh, cutting our energy usage and costs, uh, both in our homes as well as um, with our public offices and businesses and so on. So we're gonna get a lot of information tonight. And uh, I know we've all faced very high utility bills, so we get very conscious of our energy costs um, and of course, gasoline and, and so on. So um, we, we need to figure out ways that we can save dollars, but also to pre protect our environment in the future. And uh, we have a goal in New York State um, which I think we have some slides that we'll talk about it, um, you know, to, to really deal with, with climate issues. And uh, so whatever we can do, uh, we'll move that um, barometer to the, to the right place. So we did in Albany, and we just have gotten back from Albany, but, um, you know, we had a number of pieces of legislation that we worked on. I just wanted to mention just a couple because we found that in the energy law and particularly with the Public Service Commission that our laws were outdated and they would impede any updates that we wanted to, for energy codes and so on. So, um, you know, that's something that we really need to work on. And we, we did pass some legislation on that. And also to get um, ener more energy efficiency standards for our appliances. And then we took up the whole issue, and I don't really know a lot about cryptocurrency, uh, but I learned quite a bit. Um, and we have established a moratorium because in some areas of the cryptocurrency development, uh, there's a lot of usage of energy, a uh, huge number of computers, uh, a drain on uh, much of our energy resources. So we're, we're doing a moratorium in certain areas of cryptocurrency development uh, to do an environmental study to find out you know, where we are going in that area. And um, also, um, and Joel Gingold would appreciate this uh, because he's so, been so involved in Indian Point, but um, also trying to transition uh, jobs from utility workers uh, that are losing employment, which they obviously did at Indian Point, and to do better training uh, for individuals. So that, that's just a little bit of some of the things that we did. Um, and I know we'll get more information out to all of you on that. And now I'm going to introduce my guests. We have four guests this evening, but we're going to start with Scott Smith. And Scott is the Clean Heating and Cooling Program Manager from the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority called NYSERDA. Uh, so New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. And prior to joining NYSERDA, Scott worked as an environmental consultant helping to clean up environmental contaminants in upstate New York. I don't know how far you were upstate, Scott, in that. Um, where, where were you? I was cleaning up the, the pollution uh, that went into the Hudson River, so Hudson Falls. Maybe. Oh, okay. Okay. So we appreciated that. Thank you. The river moves down here, right? Sure does. <laughs> okay, and he's going to, Scott is going to kick us off um, providing a context for the New York climate policies and programs. So Scott, I'm going to turn it over to you. And for those that have questions, what we're going to do is after the four people speak, uh, we'll have Q&A. So just keep your questions for then. So Scott, you're on. So, sounds great. And actually, I just realized, uh, Lauren, you're sharing the slides, right? Just making sure. So, uh, so I'm get Gail, thanks for having me and everybody for joining. Um, as Lauren said earlier, this beautiful night. Um, and as the assembly woman just said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set some context for uh, some of our energy and climate policy um, in New York. Um, and then really happy to be here with uh, Lauren and, and uh, Claire and Joe, uh, who will take it from there. Um, so 
And I think as, as, as the assemblywoman referred to, uh, you know, in 2019, New York passed some really aggressive uh, climate legislation, some of the most aggressive in the country and, and even in the world. Um, and that sets us on a path toward uh, decarbonizing our economy, you know, eliminating the carbon emissions from our economy, 40% um, by 2030, uh, which is coming up quick, uh, and 80% um, by 2050. A big part of that is we're gonna we're gonna have a lot more renewable energy, and we've you know we we and our, our colleagues in in state government and private industry have made a lot of progress on that front already. Uh, we'll have seventy percent renewable energy by twenty thirty, uh, and you know a lot of it in on, on onshore wind and solar, uh, but we'll, we're also working toward development of offshore wind um, resources. And a really key thing to what a lot of us are going to talk about tonight in this transition is that we're going to have, even though even though we'll have 70% renewable energy by 2030, our electricity is going to be carbon free by 2040. And so essentially, and I'll talk, I'll say this again in a couple of different ways as I go through these other slides, but the plan is the the, the over, overarching concept of, of what's happening under the Climate Act and the, and the, uh, the, the, um, scoping plan that was issued by the Climate Action Council is to um, is to make electricity carbon free and then electrify a lot of the end uses that currently use fossil fuel, uh, like heating buildings and transportation being the two primary ones. Um, so as this says, that puts us on a path to carbon neutrality. Um, one thing that I want to mention in the law, and, and I, I think I, I'll, I'll apologize in advance that I don't know that we're going to focus much of the rest of this conversation on this unless they're you know, questions you have, but um, it's really um, laudable in my in, in my opinion that the law has a very um, a very specific focus on environmental justice and supporting um, co communities that have been uh, previously distressed by um, you know by the climate pollution and by the energy um, sector that we've had and and making as I think as somebody woman Gail mentioned before. Uh, creating a just transition of the workforce that exists now to the workforce of the future. Um, one important thing I, I, I sort of alluded to a minute ago is that the law created a climate action council, which is co-chaired by NYSERDA and the Department of Environmental Conservation. Lots of other people involved, uh, a tremendous amount of cross-sector um, input that we've gotten um, from a series of working groups and from, from, from all of you. Um, I think I'm going to mention it a little bit more, but there's a scoping plan that's recently been released that's important to pay attention to. Next slide. Um, so this shows the same thing I was just talking about, maybe just by the numbers, sort of, um, you know, and, and so very, very aggressive, but um, we're, we're on a path. Uh, we, we are confident it's doable if we all pull together, and certainly all of you that are here today have a role to play. Um, it's sort of an all hands on deck um, approach that we need to take to making this transition. Um, you know, and so we need, we need a lot of renewables, we need a lot of energy storage. And again, a key thing here in this conversation we're having tonight is that, you know, our, our, our electricity is going to be carbon free um, in a few short years, in, in, in a little over a decade. Next slide. So this was something that was presented to the Climate Action Council. And I, I, I use this slide just because I think it's a Although, although busy, it's sort of a, a representation of, of kind of how the, 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 we, we, you know, we hired a consultant to help us look at you know, how, how can we get there? We, we know what the end, end state is, where we need to be. How to, you know, what things can we do to get there? How do we, what things do we need to do to get there? Um, and I'll just, uh, you know, I mentioned electrification of transportation. So that's ZEVs on here, or zero emission vehicles. I mentioned electrification of, of building heating and that's heat pumps. Um, and that's a lot of what we're going to talk about in the rest of the rest of the conversation. Um, and you know, by 2030, to get us on our on our path, 50 to 70 percent of the sales of heating systems in New York need to be heat pumps. And by 2050, virtually all of them. Um, and similar high, high penetration um, targets for for zero emission vehicles. Um, next slide. Um, so you know. Uh, one thing that I maybe haven't touched on yet that's really critical here is we're going to make buildings. We need to make buildings more efficient in order in order to facilitate this change. If we were to just simply electrify all buildings without making them more efficient, we would have a grid that would be unsustainable. Um, so there's a huge focus on energy efficiency and conservation. 
as I've mentioned a couple of times, electrifying the things that um, are, you know, are currently using high carbon output fossil fuels. Um, and, um, and, and then the, you know, the key to, to all of that electrification is having decarbonized electricity. Um, I alluded to this a little bit, but earlier this year, a couple of months ago now, the Climate Action Council released a draft scoping plan. Um, I'm gonna talk about a couple of policy things that fit together with that. Um, but I wanna emphasize that that is out for public comment right now. Um, there's been a series of meetings around the state, a couple in your area uh, that have been collecting uh, f you know, feedback in, a, in, a, in virtual and in-person formats. There's also a, a, an email address um, that you can send comments to and the comment period is open until July 1st. I think the last I checked with a colleague, we had over 15,000 email um, submissions and that's fantastic. Um, the more feedback uh, on this, the better it's gonna be for all of us. Um, so I encourage you to, to engage in that process. Um, so we have a few things going on. So there's that scoping plan, which sort of that's, that's set in stage for this overall transition. And informing that, and kind of it's a two-way street, right? You know, um, these, these roadmaps I'm about to talk about inform the scoping plan and vice versa. We have a carbon neutral buildings roadmap that I sort of um, develop, which is, developed, which is a view toward um, 2050. It's a longer horizon view. Like what, what, is, what is the decarbonized, what, what do decarbonized buildings look like in 2050? How do we get there? What are some, what, is, what, are, the, what are the paths to get there? Then sort of a subset of that is an electrification roadmap, which has a nearer term kind of viewpoint. What do we need to do? Um, right now, there's not a lot of heat pumps in, in the market or not anywhere near as many as need to be. And so what do we do in the near term to kind of ramp that up and put us on the right trajectory for 2030? And so that's the building electrification roadmap. The carbon neutral buildings roadmap, there's a draft of that on our website. The buildings electrification roadmap is under development right now and should be issued for public comment um, sometime this year, uh, this fall. Um, and then sort of kind of related to all of those things, but a near, uh, you know, sort of a nearer term thing is in the state of the state this year, Governor Hochul um, issued a directive to us and our fellow state agencies to develop a plan to get to 2 million climate friendly homes by 2030. Um, 1 million of those will be ready to be electrified or efficient and the other million will be elect electrified. Um, again, it's gotta be aligned with all, the, <clears throat> all of these other things, the electrification roadmap, the <clears throat> carbon neutral buildings roadmap. Um, and there's a plan that will be developed um, and put out for comment later this year that NYSERDA is working on with the Department of Homes, Homes and Community Renewal and some of our other partners. Um, and that, so that's gonna put us on a path to having 2 million climate friendly homes uh, by 2030. Hopefully that gives you a picture of how these things kind of relate to each other and fit together. Next slide. So a little bit more on 2 million homes. Um, again, it's in the state of the state address, as I mentioned, we need to develop an electric, uh, an executable plan and a fund, along with that plan, a funding proposal. Um, and there's a specific emphasis on strategies to leverage private capital. Um, and I think it's true for this 2 million homes plan. It's true for the scoping plan as a whole. You know, we, we won't be able to make this transition. There won't be enough money um, or resources to make this transition if we simply rely on public sources of funding like ratepayer funding or taxpayer funding or other sources like that. So it's really important that we all collectively find ways to leverage private capital and, and, you, and, and use that to facilitate the transition. Um, I said some of this already, but you know we're looking for a million electrified homes, homes that homes and apartments. So we're talking about housing units. I should have been clear. It's not just single family homes. It would also include apartments. So a million um, of a total of both homes and apartments, um, and a million of them are going to be ready to be electrified. So that means they're going to be energy efficient. Um, they're probably going to include you know make sure that there's elect, uh, adequate electric supply. Um, and then 1 million of them will actually be uh, electrified, meaning that they'll have heat pumps for both heating and hot water and, um, and, uh, and the capacity to serve them. And consistent with the goals in the Climate Act, you know, at least 800,000 or 40% of those 2 million homes will be low to moderate income households uh, that, are, that are sort of by definition in disadvantaged communities. 
Um, and then just at the bottom, I just wanted to drive home to everybody the scale of what we're talking about doing here. And it's doable, right? We, we converted from, you know, um, in, in the past, we, we've, we've converted from primarily like dung, dung related fuel so sources to then coal and then from coal to oil and oil to natural gas. So in, in relatively short order. So that, that's happened. We've done it as an economy a number of times, but it is a pretty aggressive transition we're talking about. Um, and so, you know, we're talking about 10, you know, an increase from, from of 10 times um, the number of homes, you know, that are being converted today uh, that have to be converted per year by 2030. And I think that might be my last slide. Oh, one more. Okay. So, uh, and Claire, thanks for fixing this for me, by the way. So, um, this, this slide, I, I'm not going to dwell on this too much, except to say the good news is that for most of these solutions, not all of them, but most, most of the solutions there, there are technically available, technologies available to do it. Um, and in many cases, especially for new buildings at low or no incremental cost. Um, there, existing buildings are a lot harder um, and there are certain things that, you know, places where we need to develop technology or bring it over from overseas or improve it in order to, in order to really make this transition. I'll just point out one, one, one example of that. So electrifying 100% of hot water needs in large multifamily buildings is pretty challenging. Um, and so we're actively working on solutions uh, to do that. Um, and, you know, and, you know, so we're going to need a significant focus on, you know, overburdened communities and making sure that they are part of this transition and, the, and that they benefit and that, that um, you know, this results in energy savings for them and cost savings for them. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, and I think, you know, the, 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 the good news overall that, that, that I think this slide is sort of trying to drive home is, you know, we have, we have the means um, to do this and we just have to work together to make it happen. Um, and I think that is my last slide. And so I think with that, I'm turning it back to Assemblywoman Galef, who's gonna introduce the next speaker. Thank okay. you very much. Okay. Thanks so much, Scott. And um, we may come back to you with uh, how, how can people reach, can my constituents reach out to try to get some funding for, for these activities that may come up later on. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our three other guests and uh, it's Lauren, Claire, and Joe. So let me, and they're gonna be working together on this presentation. So um, first of all, it's Lauren uh, Boyce, who is the director of Energy Smart Homes campaign with Sustainable Westchester. And she's worked um, since 2013 to design community-based approach, helping homeowners realize energy savings. So I think probably Scott would tell me this is where we're coming. Uh, while making homes more comfortable through energy efficiency improvements uh, incentivized by NYSERDA. And then Claire Kokoska is the manager of solar programs with Sustainable Westchester. And she manages the opt-in Sustainable Westchester Community Solar Program launched in 2018. And since its establishment, she's worked to enroll several thousand residents, municipalities, and small businesses in the program. And then Joe um, Monturi, uh, who is the president of Sustainable Putnam, where he works to educate the community members and leaders, as well as to facilitate collaborative sustainability projects. And prior to this, Joe was a social studies teacher for 20 years, uh, teaching courses, including public policy and sustainability and society. So now I'm going to turn it over to Lauren, Claire, and Joe um, to share their presentation about home energy efficiencies, renewable upgrades, and options available locally. So I think Lauren's going to start, right? That's correct. Yes. And thanks so much, everyone, for being here. And thank you, Sandy, for having us. It's great to all be in this room talking about how we can save energy and also improve our lives. So you're going to be hearing about different types of programs 
Some are applicable for people that live in Westchester County, and some will be for those that live in Putnam County. And we're gonna kind of go back and forth to make this easy for folks to understand. So starting out with um, Sustainable Westchester, we are a nonprofit organization, and we are um, comprised of our member municipalities. So every single municipality in Westchester County, besides one, is a member of our organization. And that also includes Westchester County itself. So this municipal member membership structure really allows us to provide robust programming, not only to the municipalities, but to their residents, to their businesses, and to their nonprofits. So we have a whole range of programs that we provide. If you have questions, and we're going to be talking about a lot of these programs tonight, we're going to touch on our Westchester Power Program, which is our community energy supply program. You're going to hear about community solar, a way to save 10% on your energy bills. I'm gonna be talking about energy smart homes. So if you have a drafty house or if you have high heating bills, you're gonna to wanna to listen to this section of the presentation. And we're also gonna to touch on grid rewards, which is a demand response program, helps you save a couple dollars over the summer by reducing your energy. So we're probably not gonna to touch on um, electric. Well, we're not going to talk about commercial clean heating and cooling, but if you happen to be a business owner yourself, or if you have a property that you're interested in electrifying, we can help with that. We also have resources for those looking for zero waste information and electric landscaping equipment. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Joe, who will be representing his organization, Sustainable Putnam. Okay. Thanks, Lauren. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Assemblywoman Gayla, for having us tonight. Uh, and thank you to Scott Smith for joining us as well. Um, and everybody in our, in our audience. Um, just very quickly, Sustainable Putnam is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We were founded in 2020, just as I was retiring from teaching, um, 30 years, actually, not 20. Um, it <laughs> felt like 20, though, it went by quickly. Um, and uh, unfortunately, you know, because of the pandemic, uh, it's been a bit of a slow start, but uh, we've gotten a few things accomplished. And uh, here's a few of our, our programs right now. Um, Solarize Putnam, which you'll hear a little bit about um, in, later in the program. Our 100% Renewable Energy Toolkit, which is an online um, digital set of tools that you can use to help shift your household. Businesses could use it as well. Um, we've worked with libraries uh, and we're working with houses of worship as well to shift their energy use to renewable sources uh, while also eliminating carbon and fossil fuels. Um, we do coaching with uh, local governments, residents and businesses and so forth. And we're working right now to develop a new program to help low and moderate income folks in particular uh, with a, a special climate fund uh, which will involve carbon offsets uh, and grants made to, um, to folks that want to make those changes in their home. So that's the kinds of things that we're doing. And um, this is a little screenshot of our, our, our toolkit. I'll put a link uh, in the chat to a PDF that you can uh, open up and it's, it'll have links to everything that um, I'm talking about tonight. And I also want to mention that um, we're going to be talking a little fast and telling you about a lot of different programs. Don't worry if you can't keep it all in your head. Don't worry about, I wouldn't even worry about taking notes. I would just listen, maybe pop questions in the chat um, because I know that Sustainable Westchester and Sustainable Putnam, uh, Claire, Lauren and I and Scott, we are here for you after the program is over, right? So um, you know, if you need help, that's what we do uh, on a full-time basis. So um, fear not. So let's jump right in with um, what I like to call the two rules and eight tips for reducing your home energy costs. And I wanna stress that not only are you gonna save money by making these changes, um, but you'll also have a more comfortable home. I've made these changes myself in my home. I'm now fossil fuel free. Uh, and I'm amazed at how much more comfortable my home is as well and um, saving money, uh, and not to mention eliminating our carbon footprint. So rule number one is get efficient. As Scott said, um, we can't make the transition to renewable energy unless we also 
uh, are more careful with how we use it. And that doesn't necessarily mean, um, you know, uh, sacrifice on our part. It just means using energy more wisely um, with smarter equipment, um, you know, smarter appliances, vehicles, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, that sub subline there, that subheading there, the cheapest energy is the energy you don't use. That, that should be your mantra uh, because, you know, it just, uh, it's obvious, right? It makes sense. Second rule, which Scott also alluded to is we've got to electrify everything because most renewable energy, solar, wind, hydro, it's in the form of electricity, right? So if we electrify things, we can shift away from fossil fuels. Uh, and there's some examples there, and we'll be talking more about those uh, throughout the program. So here's our, our eight tips in priority order, and they go from free and easy to do down to, you know, takes might take a little bit of effort on your part, a little planning, a little project management, and a, something of an investment. Um, but that's why we put them in this order. You start at the top and work your way down, and that's the way we're going to present them. And as we go, of course, we're going to be jumping back and forth between Sustainable Putnam and Sustainable uh, Westchester. So if it's me speaking, it's probably Sustainable Putnam program. If it's Lauren or Claire, it'll probably be uh, Sustainable Westchester. But again, don't worry. You can ask questions later. So I'm going to start um, by talking about, you know, greening your electricity use. Uh, and there's two ways you can do that. And both Putnam and Westchester offer these options. The first involves community choice aggregation. Um, and that's a program whereby your community, right, kind of aggregates all of the utility customers within the community to make a choice in terms of who you're going to buy your electricity from. And the choice is usually a renewable source and it's usually um, at a good price. Um, uh, in Putnam County, it's only really available in Phillipstown um, right now through Hudson Valley Community Power. Uh, and in um, Westchester, it's available through Westchester Power and Claire will, uh, I believe Claire or Lauren, will be talking more about that momentarily. The other option is community solar. It's a, it's a form of um, solar power that a there's a lot of confusion about. Uh, it's a little complicated to explain, but it's really easy to do. All you have to do is sign up online. It costs you nothing. Uh, we'll tell you more about that shortly. So um, yeah, I really already walked through this slide, so I think we can skip it. Um, these are the Putnam County programs uh, available in terms of community choice. Again, it's only for Phillipstown residents at this point. All right. I think we are on to... I think Claire? Yes, mm -hmm. that'll be me. So um, okay. I'm Claire Kokoska, manager of solar programs at Sustainable Westchester, as um, Assemblywoman Galef said. Um, but we work very closely with the Westchester Power um, program within our organization. So Westchester Power is a community choice aggregation program. And like Sustainable Putnam's program, it, uh, Sorry, my mouse. All better. Okay, sorry. sorry. Uh, so as Joe was explaining, um, community choice aggregation is a program where it allows municipalities that participate. Um, it, it involves a lengthy process of vetting the program, making sure that the municipalities and local governments and uh, local community organizations know the implications of it and what it means for its residents, um, just so that everyone is very informed going into it. And it's a really wonderful way of collecting the uh, local, um, you know, all local community members and the local government to pool our, our resources and be able to leverage that to get better renewable electricity supply prices. Um, and it is a fixed rate. So the people that participate in, in Westchester Power or um, uh, other CCAs, they are not uh, subject to those wild fluctuations in utility pricing that many of you have seen, especially earlier this year. Um, and it's a fantastic way of boosting community engagement and 
um, excitement about renewable energy and accelerating renewable energy growth in Westchester County and Putnam and um, throughout the state in general. And here at Sustainable Westchester, we're very proud of Westchester Power. It was the first community choice aggregation program in New York State. Um, and we're so happy to see that it's a model used throughout the state now um, to help people boost renewable electricity. And for our program, Westchester Power, we now have 29 municipalities participating um, and 145,000 residents and small businesses within those 29 municipalities are a part of the Westchester Power program um, to get that renewable electricity. And this is just a small visual to show sort of how it works. Um, as, as Joe and I were saying, the each CCA program administrator, so whether it's sustainable Putnam or solar, excuse me, sustainable Westchester, we go through this process with potential um, electricity suppliers of renewable energy to vet them and ensure that whoever we select for the renewable energy supply there, um, they provide great service, they provide 100% renewable electricity, and that the rates that they can provide are advantageous and um, then we decide to bring them into the program. They deliver the renewable electricity to the utility and the utility continues to deliver your electricity, um, but by being a part of the program, you're supporting that renewable uh, electricity supply. And it makes a huge difference. So in our program alone, over a million metric tons of carbon dioxide mitigated. Um, that's equivalent to uh, almost 300,000 cars off the roads for a year or um, almost 20 million tree seedlings um, if they were to have grown for 10 years. So it, it really does make a massive impact. And I'm gonna pass it back to Joe to, uh, we'll pivot from CCA programs to discuss community solar. Thanks, Claire. Um, so community solar, as I mentioned before, it sounds complicated, but again, very easy to do. Um, community solar is a program authorized by New York State, um, and you basically are subscribing to uh, solar electricity from a solar farm somewhere in New York State. They put their power into the grid, and um, you wind up getting 10% off your electric bill. So it saves you money, it costs you nothing. It's just a few clicks on the computer. Um, no installation involved, 10% um, lower electricity costs for 20 years or the life of the solar farm that varies from program to program. But um, generally that's the case. You can cancel at any time. Um, even if you're part of a community choice aggregation program that we were just discussing, you can still do community solar. Um, so it's kind of a no brainer, you know, I mean, it's good for your pocketbook. It's, it's good for the environment uh, and it's good for the solar industry in New York state. And it's good for meeting our, our climate goals here in New York. Um, at the bottom of that last bullet, um, right now with so Solarized Putnam, you can get a $100 gift card for subscribing. That money doesn't come from us. It comes from the solar solar provider that we, we are working with. Um, that's That deal might not you know, be um, around for long. I'm not sure they can change that at any point. But right now, if you sign up, that's the deal. And you can do that from our, our website. Um, whoops. Uh, so very basically, here's how community solar works. Essentially, as I mentioned, you subscribe to a solar farm. Um, for every subscriber, they put the amount of electricity you are using on an annual basis. They average it out, and they are putting that amount into the grid. The utility must then accept that power, uh, and it just goes out through the grid. It doesn't necessarily go to your home. It just goes to everybody's home. That's the way the grid works. Um, but you get credited for that, that solar electricity um, from the solar provider, and it goes onto your utility bill. So um, I guess next slide. And Claire is gonna kind of dig deeper here with some more details about the billing and so forth. 
Yes. And um, so as Scott said, the solar credits that you earn, um, you get a 10% savings off of those each month, um, which can be up to 10% off your total electricity bill. So it's a fantastic way of signing up to a free program. You can cancel any time for no cost, and you do get this consistent savings on your electricity costs. Um, now, I'm going to show you how it works now. It's a two-step process currently, um, but there are some exciting changes that will really simplify this in, in the coming months. So right now, um, and this is an example for a Con Ed bill because many of the folks in Westchester have Con Edison, but it's the same general process whether you have Con Ed, uh, NYSEG, uh, National Grid, Central Hudson, it doesn't matter the utility, it's, it's um, pretty standard. So on your utility bill, generally on the first page, you'll see um, an area where there's a negative dollar amount and different utilities have different words and terms for it. In Con Ed, it's adjustment, but your solar credit shows up as a negative dollar amount, lowers your total electricity bill. In this case, um, we'll assume a solar credit of $100, meaning your bill goes down $100 to the utility. Step two is you pay your solar farm for the amount of that solar credit at a 10% discount. There's a lot of um, orange here, but the takeaway is that um, you save $10 overall for a $100 solar credit. Now in the future, the second step will be eliminated and the savings will all be right on your utility bill. We're very excited for that change that's coming up in many of our solar farms already. That has, um, uh, the utility has made that transition, but it's, it's going to be um, even more streamlined than it currently is to get that savings by supporting solar energy. So community solar is a wonderful program um, on, on all counts. And now I am Sarah, going I, to... Mm -hmm. I just want to mention that in uh, if you are a NYSEG or Central Hudson customer, it is one bill that you're getting from the utility with the solar credits directly on there, which is what Claire was uh, just referencing. And then it's coming to Con Ed, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So... Um, I mean, it's on NYSEG as one bill, is that right? Not not for yeah. all solar farms, but most of them. So yeah, most solar farms in NYSEG do, not all. I learned something new today. I love it. <laughs> the ones that um, we've been uh, accessing through Power Market, that's the, the solar provider that we use, they've, um, they've all been one bill. Okay, so we're up to tip number two, um, which is really simple, um, super simple. I'm sure many of you have already taken this step. Um, and um, let's see, do I have control? Oh. If you could just click, you, there's just gonna be a bunch of arrows that pop up as you click. But the big point here is that, you know, if you take a look at the difference between a standard incandescent light bulb um, and an LED, it's unbelievable, right? You're using like one sixth of the uh, energy for almost the same amount of light or lumens. Um, they last forever. I mean, if you've got a young child at home right now, they'll be out of college by the time you need to replace that light bulb. So, uh, and, and the cost of the bulbs, I actually had to change the slide because the cost of the bulbs used to be quite expensive, but LED bulbs, you can get them now for a dollar in some stores. Uh, you can get them at you know Lowe's, Home Depot, Target, uh, and you can also get them online uh, if your utility, many utilities have an online store and they offer LED light bulbs at bargain basement prices. Um, so, you know, and, and even if you have compact fluorescence, it makes sense, economic sense to make the switch over if you do wind up pulling out some compact fluorescent bulbs though. Don't throw them in the trash because most of them have some mercury in them, small amounts of mercury. Drop them off at Home Depot or Lowe's. They'll take them for free. They've got a bin near the entrance uh, and you can just leave them in there. Don't break them though. Um, yeah, so uh, LED bulbs, you know, definitely uh, the way to go. Okay, 
think. Uh, okay, now we're on yeah. our third tip. This is quite a journey <laughs> you're all taking with us tonight. We're just going tip by tip, and definitely we want to hear if that's helpful as a way to get all of this into your mind. So. Tip number three is also really easy. It does not require you to install anything. It's just more of a sign up to do. So this program, Grid Rewards, is a really fun program. It's an app on your phone. You can download the app on your phone or you can sign up on your computer, whatever you prefer. And it is a way to help you earn cash back by saving energy over the summertime. So I like to start with my own story. I did this program last year in my apartment. I live in White Plains. We had five demand response events last summer. I only participated in three of those events and I got a check in the mail for $107. So there's some good money to come back here. And when you do download the app and hook it up to your Con Edison account, oh, I should mention this is only for people that have Con Ed for their utility right now. There's a way that you can take a look and learn a lot of insights about your energy usage. So you can take a look and see how much energy are you using per day? What is the kilowatt hour equivalent of that? What is the carbon emissions equivalent of that? And what is the cost of that? So the other day I was outside with my neighbors and we all had our Grid Rewards app open. We were seeing who's using the most energy in their apartment. So it's a great way to kind of get a handle on what's going on in your own home. And it's an also a nice way, there's some tips and ideas here about how you can lower your own energy usage year round. And I also like to check the app because it will tell you when the grid is more carbon intensive or not. So you can take a look if it's a good time of day to use electricity, it means the energy grid is not that stressed. There's a lot more clean energy on the grid and it's a good time to do laundry or run the dishwasher. Sometimes you'll see this says it's a really bad time of day to use electricity. And when it says that, I'm happy to just not do my chores and not run the dishwasher, not run the laundry, and just wait till it's a good time to use electricity. So um, I'm going to just talk a little bit more about the app, but there is this QR code if you want to try it out right now. You can hold your phone up to the screen scan that QR code just like you're at a restaurant and it will help you to download the app on your phone. And the whole point of the grid rewards program is that we are reducing our energy usage at key times in the summer. So in the summertime, when everyone's running their air conditioning and using electricity, the utility company needs to turn on what they call peaker plants. These are power plants that provide additional energy to the grid in those most stressed times. The bad news is the peaker plants are really just Con Ed's older utility plants that they don't turn on for most of the year, they keep them just for these days. So these old plants, as you can assume, like old mechanicals, are the most polluting and also really expensive for the utility to operate. So the good news is we can collectively reduce our energy at peak times. The application of grid rewards will send you a little alert. OK, a demand response time is coming up. We collectively reduce our energy usage. Con Ed does not need to turn on their peaker plant and instead can pay us to reduce that energy usage. So um, I know we're just throwing so much information at everybody tonight. So if there's something that, like Joe is saying, piques your interest, feel free to give us a call tomorrow. And we also have a wealth of information about all these programs on our website. Um, so I can drop some links in the chat. So we're moving right along to tip number four and Joe is gonna walk us through that. Um, so take it away, Joe. <laughs> You're muted. Everybody gets a dollar. We had to say it one time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, we've already said this a couple of times. I think Scott was underscoring this point that we really need to be efficient. Uh, and while putting solar panels on your roof is like the most fun thing, you know, and psychologically, I think, rewarding thing to do. Um, sealing and insulating your home is actually the first thing you should do before you get to the solar panels, before you get the EV uh, or whatever. You know, um, It's not very exciting. You can't really see it, but you'll feel the difference. And the, way to, the best way to start is with an energy audit. And you can get a, an energy audit through a NYSERDA approved contractor. It'll cost maybe $250. Um, and they will go through your house with you know infrared 
uh, cameras and detect heat loss uh, from your walls, your ceilings, your window frames, your door frames, et cetera. They'll do a blower door test and they will literally um, close all the windows and doors in your house and put this blower on your front door and try to suck air out and they'll measure how much air gets sucked out. Uh, and they know what numbers are good and what numbers are bad. And that'll give them a good sense of whether you need, you know, more caulking, weather stripping, et cetera. They'll, they'll give you a, a really full report um, with an estimate on what it would cost to make all those changes. You, you're under no obligation to hire them to do it. You can hire somebody else. You can do nothing if you, if you so choose. Um, but it's really good scientifically based information that you can use then to move forward in terms of your household energy conservation. Obviously, once you've got the audit done, uh, a really important element of that is to eliminate air infiltration from the envelope, right? The, the boundary between the uh, heated portion of your home or cooled portion of your home uh, and the unheated or uncooled exterior of your home. Um, that could involve you know, caulking, weather stripping. Uh, you can do it yourself. You can hire a professional um, or like me, you can try to do it yourself and then hire a professional. Um, and then there's also, of course, insulation, um, also vitally important. I know when I was a kid uh, and then during the first oil embargo, uh, I was putting six inches of uh, fiberglass insulation into my parents' attic and that was good. That was considered, you know, uh, adequate. That it's about half of what you need and what's recommended today. So times have changed. And if you've got old insulation in your attic, um, it degrades over time and it becomes less effective. Um, that's something that an audit uh, can tell you. There's all kinds of materials you can use. Again, you can do this yourself in the attic, the, the crawl space or basement, your heating and cooling ducts. You might be able to do that yourself, but the walls, when it comes to the walls, unless it's new construction, you probably need to hire a professional and they can do all of the above. Um, so, you know, really important uh, things to do. First step, energy audit, then ceiling and, and insulation. Um, just a, a photo of uh, a professional uh, blowing in cellulose. That's what I had put into my walls. Um, one of the advantages of this is that it actually compresses the old insulation and it, it forms a, a really good uh, effective layer of, of insulation. Um, that's something I was not obviously able to do. They've got machinery uh, that's designed to do that. Whoops, sorry, I think I that's okay. went forward too far there. It's all good. So Joe is talking about home energy efficiency, adding insulation to your house and all that good stuff. And if that's kind of piquing your interest, you might be wondering, okay, so how do I actually do this? The good news is there is a New York State program that's available for homeowners and in some cases renters to make their houses more energy efficient by adding insulation and air sealing. So um, there's some more pictures here to get a sense of what they're doing. Again, the blown in cellulose, that picture all the way on the right. This is actually a material made out of recycled newspapers. Sometimes there's blue jeans mixed in there. It has a very high R value about how much heat can transfer through it. So it's a great way to make your house feel immediately. I go to people's houses the first day they get the insulation done. They're shocked how quiet their house is, how much more comfortable it is, how much less drafty. So good, good stuff. And the best news is there's a lot of bang for your buck. So you may be thinking, okay, yes, I have high energy bills. My house is sweltering in the summer. Um, and my house has icicles in the winter. Those are all situations that suggest you should have a home energy assessment and then consider doing that home energy upgrade work. So there is a New York State program. There's a lot of programs in different names, but just know you can call Sustainable Westchester or reach out to Joe and we can point you to a list of recommended installers that participate in this nice sort of program called Comfort Home. Now, there are additional programs based off of someone's income level, so very similar adding insulation, air sealing, but if you are someone that is on a limited income or a fixed budget, 
you may also benefit from additional incentives. So for this first program, Comfort Home, there are rebates between $500 and $4,000. That's for the average income earner. People can qualify for those rebates. But for someone, and I have the income limitations listed here, so you could just figure out, let's say it's two people in a house. If their income is falling below 72800 in Westchester, or 76,400 in Putnam, you can qualify for an additional $5,000 in rebates from New York State. And that's, it's a discount of 50% on the cost of your job up to $5,000. And um, people that have enhanced star property tax exemption usually do qualify for this program, Assisted Home Performance with Energy Star. And again, we have the contractors that we recommend that do this work. And then finally, I'll mention the EMPOWER program. This is for people that are perhaps receiving SNAP benefits, HEAP benefits. These folks are falling in the income ranges listed here. This is for all of New York State. So no matter where you are, Putnam, Westchester, if your income for your household falls under this um, limit, depending on the number of income or number of people in the house, you could qualify. And this program can give you $10,000 worth of free home energy upgrade work. This program works for people that are homeowners or renters in apartment buildings less than 100 units. So if you're in an apartment, you likely would have electrification measures like a new refrigerator, new lighting, low flow shower head, things like that. But if you have ownership of the property, they can consider even adding the insulation. And the good news is right now, if you know someone that is struggling financially or receiving um, benefits, if you know them, tell them to reach out to us because there's actually $20,000 on the table right now for these people to take advantage of to get heat pumps paired with insulation. So that is going to go away like in September or so. So if you know someone, a senior or a lower income person that could qualify, this is a great way to help them improve their quality of life by improving their house and to get $20,000 worth of free home energy upgrade work. And I know I keep saying for all of these slides, free rebates, great stuff, but let's remember our utility bill has a small tax called the SBC charge, systems benefits charge. We're all paying into this program with NYSERDA. So while it's free, you are getting the benefit of your taxes. So you might as well call and get that home energy assessment, see what you can um, work out. So I don't have my slide of contractors, but I'll put in the chat my, um, my information if you wanna get in touch. Okay, and now we're on tip number five. Okay, so tip number five is to shop and plan for buying electric appliances to replace what you have in your house. Obviously, this is not would not be economical to just go out and buy a new refrigerator, buy a new stove in order to be more efficient, right? That would be a waste of money and materials. It'd go, you know, some materials would go to the landfill. That's not good. Um, but as those things break, you want to be ready to make the shift. Uh, and so we emphasize planning in advance, get familiar with, with what's out there and available that's more efficient and electric. Um, if you're cooking with gas, um, so to speak, um, you want to get uh, an electric um, stove, an oven uh, at some point in the future, and not just any uh, electric uh, range, you want to get an induction cooktop, which is, um, uh, as a friend of mine says, cooking with magnets. Um, you're, you're using iron or steel cookware, um, and it's super efficient. The cooktop doesn't even get hot. It's amazing. Um, it's now chefs and restaurants in Europe, they all use induction cook. Nobody uses gas anymore in Europe. Uh, it's, just, it's just as efficient, and it, it heats quickly, and it cools down quickly, like the way gas does, which was always a drawback with older electric ranges. So those are a really great innovation. If you have an air fryer, hey, you're being efficient. They're, they cook more efficiently than um, a microwave or a regular oven. They are in fact a form of convection ovens. So that's another thing, another innovation that you can you know, consider purchasing down the road. Um, clothes washers and dryers have gotten much more efficient. You can actually get a clothes dryer that is powered by a heat pump so you're not burning any fossil fuels at all. You're not creating any heat through electric resistance anymore. Um, it doesn't even need to be vented outside. 
So you can you can bring one into an apartment and um, plug it in, uh, and um, it condenses the the moisture out of your clothing, uh, and it the clothes aren't even hot uh, when you take them out of the dryer. Uh, amazing stuff. So um, you know, in our renewable toolkit, we've got planning documents that you can use to kind of keep notes on um, future purchases and what you're interested in, brands, models, et cetera, so that you're ready. Because we all know when an appliance goes, you need to replace it right away, right? So that's why we suggest planning in advance. Um, one other benefit I want to mention is, you know, propane and uh, fossil gas, uh, formerly called natural gas, um, stoves and ovens, they release contaminants, uh, indoor pollutants into your air. Uh, and they actually contribute to asthma and upper respiratory infections. So not good, right? It's, there's another reason to, to make this sh shift. Okay, where's my mouse? Got it. So go ahead. No, God, this is you. Oh, okay, um, I, thought, I thought you were, wanted to add something. Um, just a quick slide with a, um, uh, a screenshot from um, energystar.gov where you can actually put in the information for your refrigerator to find out how quickly it'll pay to replace it with a brand new Energy Star model. Those are my numbers in there for my refrigerator, which is only 10 years old, um, still working pretty well. It's an older Energy Star model. So I'm not gonna replace it for a while, but I, I played around with it and put in numbers for an older refrigerator and the payback is a lot faster. So, you know, it's a nice little online tool. There's also a rebate finder and, a, you know, a product finder down there uh, at the bottom that you can link to. And I've got links to this in the document I'll share with you later. So we're not gonna talk a lot about electric vehicles. That's a whole nother presentation. But I do want to just mention that, uh, as you can see from this uh, graphic, if you go from a large gasoline-powered car to a smaller gasoline-powered car, you're pretty much cutting your carbon in half. And, and obviously, you're going to be saving uh, on uh, your fuel as well. And everybody knows gasoline prices uh, have gone through the roof right lately. And as you move down this little ladder here, this little staircase here, as you go to a, a hybrid or a plug-in hybrid, or an electric vehicle, you can actually get to a near zero carbon footprint, uh, especially as the grid gets green um, and the electricity is, is all from renewable sources. Um, it's super efficient. The other great thing about EVs is that not only you're spending less on fuel, um, about, uh, I, I spend about one third the cost, the price of uh, for the price of fuel in electricity that I would in gasoline to go the same number of miles. Uh, it's probably closer to a quarter now with the way gas prices have gone up. But beyond that, over the lifetime of a vehicle, there is so much less maintenance involved in an electric vehicle that it's actually cheaper to own an EV over its lifetime than it is to own a gasoline powered car. More upfront cost, but less cost in the long run. And that's true of a lot of these. Uh, te technological innovations. So um, in terms of your heating, ventilation, and air conditioning or HVAC system, um, you definitely want to plan this out, right? Because you do not want to be without your, your furnace or your boiler when it's uh, zero degrees outside. Um, so plan ahead. Uh, you know, if your service contractor says, you know, it's probably time to replace the furnace, Tell them you want to look into heat pumps and see if they install them. If not, Sustainable Westchester and Sustainable Putnam and NYSERDA's websites can guide you to NYSERDA approved contractors uh, from whom you can purchase and have these installed. Um, I want to underscore um, anybody that has central air conditioning, you are a prime candidate. If that compressor is going, um, replace it with a heat pump instead of a traditional heat pump air conditioner. The only difference is the uh, heat pump air, the heat pump has a, a valve that reverses the direction, the flow of the heat to out of your house to into your house. Um, it costs a little bit more, but you're going to be heating and cooling basically with your air conditioning. What was your air conditioning system? Um, it's a beautiful thing. And I've helped people to make that transition and they're super happy with it. And the, the, the furnace is now removed 
from your your basement. Um, yeah, so the basically heat pumps are the answer for all heating and ventilation is the most efficient way to heat your home, um, bar none, uh, no question about it. There's a couple of different types and I believe Lauren is gonna get into the details on that one. That's right. And I'm gonna go through it quickly because we want like a half hour for Q&A, right? Okay, so um, we talked about home energy efficiency, the first step to making sure your house is prepared to make the switch to heat pumps. And Joe talked about planning for the future. It's not like um, you're gonna run out if you have a new furnace or if you have a new heating or cooling system, you don't wanna replace that tomorrow. But you know, if it's getting older, you're thinking about in the next couple of years, you're gonna need a new heating or cooling system. It's worth having the assessment now to get prepared for the future. You may even find that making the switch which is just like the refrigerator is more efficient than keeping that old system. So there's air source heat pumps and there's ground source heat pumps, which we're gonna talk about. But first, an easy one is a heat pump hot water heater. So everybody's got their hot water heater. They have to replace them every 10 years or so. Um, so why not replace it when it breaks with a heat pump hot water heater? It's the most efficient way to heat water. It's a very reliable system and it also is, um, it's a little bit more expensive than a typical hot water heater. I'll say that. But since it's three to, time, three to four more times more efficient, it has a very quick payback period. In the fall, you're gonna to start to see these heat pump hot water heaters at the big box stores have a coupon on them so that you can get an instant rebate when you purchase it. That's coming in the fall. So the only conditions is if you have a hot water heater in your basement now, this is a good thing to think about switching out. The basement needs to be tall enough. As you can see, there's like this little bit on top is taller than a traditional hot water heater. So you just wanna make sure you have enough ceiling space. This is not exactly something that belongs in a closet. Um, so there's some, you know, things you might want to think about, but you can call one of the contractors on our list as well, and they can help you figure out the best solution if a heat pump hot water heater works in a certain area of your home. Oops. Okay. So moving right along to air source heat pumps. So you've seen air source heat pumps before. They come in two different ways, but you've seen the ones that look like this. Maybe in a restaurant you've seen them before or when you are traveling or perhaps you even have them in your own home. These are the ductless air source heat pumps, also called ductless mini splits. These are a good solution for people that are looking to cool their rooms and heat their rooms that don't have existing ductwork or don't have any desire to install it. So this picture is the indoor unit and here is the picture right here on the right hand side of the outdoor unit. So this outdoor unit can be connected to a couple of heads on the inside. And there's also lots of different applications for the registers. There's a low sitting one. There's different options. If you don't like the look of this, don't feel discouraged. But definitely we encourage people to explore. And then for air source heat pumps, there's also a whole home air source heat pump solution. So if you have existing ductwork, you can get that whole house air source heat pump right into where your existing system was. Okay, I know we're going super fast, but ground source heat pumps do require a bit more construction at the house, but it is the most efficient um, heating and cooling system. It requires drilling wells in your yard. A lot of people say, well, my yard is really rocky or oh, my yard is too small, but don't be discouraged. Rock is good. They want rock when they're drilling the wells. And many of these drill rigs really have gotten quite small and can fit onto small properties. So you can call the geothermal contractors. They can even look at your house through Google and let you know online without even coming to your house if they think you'd be a good candidate. Um, and this picture of Jen in Katona, she is so happy with her geothermal system because there's no outdoor equipment. So everything is buried underground, and then you've got the indoor equipment in the basement. And more good news for ground source heat pumps is that there's just tons of rebates. There are rebates from New York State as of January 1, 2022. There's a 26% federal tax credit, and there's also rebates from the utilities. So 
Again, having that assessment of your house. Do you have existing ductwork? Do you want to install ductwork? That's, those are um, important conditions to have for geothermal. And um, we definitely encourage people to have the site assessments for the heat pumps. Okay, that was a lot of info. So we're on tip number eight now, installing solar panels. And our last tip for tonight. That's right. um, so installing the solar panels, you know, if you've already, you know, gone with community solar, um, that's great. And, and you're essentially done. But uh, if you really want, uh, you can install solar panels on your home. Um, you would have to drop the community solar program, small detail. Um, it is an investment, right? It's expensive. You've got to make sure that your, your home is solar ready, which means, you know, you, you plan to stay in it. You've got the money to invest. Your roof is in good shape. Uh, it's not heavily shaded um, and so forth. Um, I've got a, a there's a, a tool in the toolkit to, 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 you know, find out whether your house is solar ready or not. Um, definitely recommend going with, you know, a contractor who's uh, designated as a, a quality solar installer. Um, definitely recommend getting three estimates. It's a little complicated as, a, as house projects, home improvement projects can be, um, and it takes a little bit of time. It's not going to happen overnight, especially right now during the pandemic. Um, some contractors have been having trouble getting a hold of panels because there's been a tariff dispute, which I think has just ended now. But um, it's definitely doable and it's really rewarding. This is actually my roof. Uh, this is my son there uh, on our roof, checking it out. Um, and it's really nice to get your electric bill and, and see the deduction for the power that I've generated, you know, right above my head here. Um, so it's a, it's a great thing and we definitely need more people to do it but not everybody can. So, um, you know, it's, it's a challenge, but definitely worth, uh, worth a go uh, mm -hmm. on your part. And I forgot to say solar panels and heat pumps go together like peanut butter and jelly. So for heat pumps, you're moving your, your electricity, you're gonna be using more electricity since you're not gonna be burning fossil fuels. So if you've got those solar panels, it's a perfect combination. You're generating that electricity right on site to power your appliances really good stuff. So, okay, we reached the end of the slideshow. Are people's heads spinning? Are they still with us? Hi, <laughs> this is Sandy. My head is spinning. <laughs> you covered so many areas. And I just want you to know that um, we have taped this program. So um, Claire, what we're going to put it out on YouTube. And and we can send anything if we can get the slides. Is it good to get the slides and send it out to everybody? Or it's better to listen to the commentary, I suppose. Um, whatever. Anyway, we're going to do that. And um, there were a tremendous number of tips. Scott, did you want to say anything? Because I know I asked you to do all that. And then they did it all, right? <laughs> that was by design. And I don't, I don't think I have anything to add. Maybe just accept that, that you know, what I think Lauren signaled and Joe maybe said it too, this is just a piece of what's available. There's lots of other programs available for non-residential buildings, for, for commercial buildings and schools and healthcare. It's impossible to cover it all in any period of time. Um, but, um, you know, Joe, Joe, Lauren and I, Claire, we can all help you get the information that you're looking for about whatever it is you're looking to do. And, and I know that um, Lauren put her contact information. So if anybody else has contact information, you want to, I guess Claire just did that too. Um, so that people can reach out to you. Um, it's an opportunity now for you. If you have questions, uh, why don't you, it'd be best if you could raise your hand under reactions, because it then comes closer to me uh, to find you as opposed to just physically raising their hand. Um, if you can do that, I don't know whether, I know we had some discussion about Croton, both from Jim Blair saying what's happening at the Croton point where we had the old um, refuge place at Croton and whether they can put solar there. And then Joel Gringold had uh, brought up an issue, you know, with parks. Uh, and, and parking areas, being able to put solar over parking areas. 
And um, I know what I know about that is apparently our constitution of the state of New York requires us to um, not do anything in a broad brush but be able to look at each project individually and get the meets and bounds for that project. I think actually NYSERDA, Scott, is trying to get the meets and bounds for the Croton uh, along the Hudson River project uh, for parking. Um, and I don't know whether, Joel, you want to say anything for that, but uh, we've run into a roadblock. Yorktown has been able to do it because they did a singular bill with meets and bounds. Um, Sandy, um, just quickly, uh, NIPA is kind of picking up the load there. I think there are 12 projects in Westchester that NIPA is um, putting together all the information that we'll need for these individual um, exemptions uh, from the legislature. And, so it's uh, the New York Power Authority versus NYSERDA that's so, doing it. That's power so Authority. Can I, oh. can I jump in very quickly? Claire, yes. Thank you. So Joel, I'm glad you brought this up. Um, so NYPA, which is the New York Power Authority, and Sustainable Westchester, our organization, we've partnered together um, to work with three different specific solar developers. And we are working with each, um, each municipality that said they want to participate in Westchester County to vet different sites within each of those municipalities. Um, those, each of those sites are municipally owned. Some of them um, are on already cleared land. Some of them are on municipal rooftops. Some of them are, on, um, are above parking lots, municipally owned. So there are roughly a, a dozen or more sites right now that are still in the running. Um, there's always more that we can review. Um, but yeah, there's this um, specific issue called parkland alienation where um, we can't just construct a solar canopy, which is what many of you have seen um, where there's a parking lot and you build an elevated solar installation on top of that so that you can still park cars under it people can walk under it and you know maybe you need one parking space taken up for the actual equipment but other than that everything else is completely usable um, underneath that solar canopy but the park uh, parkland alienation rule says that you can't displace use of park land and some of these parking lots fall under that rule because they're municipally owned which means that we have to go through an additional process to get approval for a lot of these parking lot sites if, if i can just Eric. add a quickie um sandy and pete harkham introduced a bill which would allow us to build um, small solar arrays in parkland parking lots without the exemption and she fought nobly right up to the end, yes. uh, right up to the last day of the legislature, there was one individual in the assembly, chairman of the committee, would not permit the bill to go through. So we're now back to the individual exemptions. So thanks, Sandy, for all you Right. Work. Well, you're welcome, but we learned about a constitution. We also found, if you haven't been to Mary Knoll in Austin, you will see that they put in um, several different, they, they have, I think it's two different parking lots where they have put solar arrays over their parking lots. But again, they are not a municipal park. Uh, so they're able to do that. So you should encourage other people uh, to do this this uh, kind of thing. Uh, but we'll, we'll we'll get to it. It's just you know it's it's trying to get around the uh, the constitution and other laws. So are there any uh, Jim Blair? You have to unmute. Yep. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, I I'm afraid that the answer to my question about Croton Point uh, was uh, was uh, responded to, but I went away so quickly I couldn't read it. Uh, just to maybe clarify the question, um, the the uh, the old uh, Croton uh, landfill has been capped, uh, and it is uh, so. It, you, we're not talking about re removing trees or anything else. It is just a, a big flat open space that can't be used for anything else because 
there's uh, you know a couple of decades at least of uh, of uh, municipal waste that's buried out there, and so I mean it it strikes me uh, and it's a big open space mm -hmm. uh, as a as an ideal location for uh, a solar farm and the the, the, the place the uh, the the point is owned by Westchester County. County Westchester yeah. County. Uh, so, I mean, it's a no-brainer. Right. Uh, um, I think Claire has, is that one of the places, uh, Claire, that they're considering um, trying to put together with NIPA? Yeah, because it's owned by the county itself, um, it's slightly more complicated to get approval for it, but I know that they're still looking into it. Um, one thing that's, that gives me a lot of hope is that if we, if there is, if they do reach approval for it, um, you know, right off the bat, I know of a very successful um, community solar farm that was built on a closed Mount Kisco landfill. Um, Mount Kisco is a town and village in Westchester County, for those of you that might be outside um, Westchester, but it is uh, a closed landfill. Uh, it was retired for 10, 15 years. And then we, we worked with a partner that specifically builds on solar on landfills in New York State. And now it's a community solar farm that supports, I think about a hundred people um, providing energy savings for the town and village. So there's a lot of really creative ways to use um, different types of properties to support renewable energy growth, landfills being one of them. So I really hope that their Croton um, landfill projects moves through. So we'll do whatever we can to help make that happen. Um, and well, thanks for your question. Okay, um, Ronnie Rodman has a question. Okay, actually it's 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 Ed Rodman. I'm using oh, Ronnie's Ed. computer Okay, right sorry. <laughs> um, uh, well, two, two things. One, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, when I saw the questions about Croton, um, I'm thinking the railroad, the railroad station parking lot. We're reviewing that too. Okay, yeah. good. I mean, that looks like a perfect spot. No trees. Yes. It's, Perfectly uh, rectangular. Yeah. And the um, station parking lot is moving ahead. We already have a contract. Oh, uh, we hope to start construction uh, later this fall. Sweet. So that, that'll, that'll happen. Great, great. The one complication I know that happens is the uh, you, you, your solar panels want to go up like 20 feet up, and the street lights are probably up like 40 feet. Yeah, so, so that's might a be problem. More lights. And if anyone does have more questions about solar um, being built in Westchester County. I did put my email in the chat, so feel free to reach out to me. We're, we're working actively with local municipalities, um, with the New York Power Authority and other solar developers to continue building solar, um, whether it's community solar farms or just solar that the building of the property itself can use. Um, so feel free to reach out to me uh, on questions like those. And I don't, I know we, um, well, I guess we have a little bit more time left, but I wondered if anyone had questions on um, home energy efficiency or community solar or um, Westchester Power or Solarize Putnam or any of the other uh, home yeah. offerings. So one or two questions on that. Um, so I'm looking, I, I'm in Westchester um, and Con Ed zone and um, I've never asked for an energy audit. I don't or energy audit. I don't know if Con Ed's still doing that. I I, I also have um, uh, our temple is in Putnam Valley, and that's uh, Nyserta. I did ask. I'm sorry, it's not Nyserta. It's Nysenk. Um and I did ask them to come and do an audit for the temple because Putnam Valley, the utility bills are ridiculous for a building that we don't use except to keep the pipes from breaking. So, so we have, we have heat, you know, uh, electric and, and, and oil consumption there for an empty building mostly. But, um, and um, NYSEG said they don't do it anymore. Um, so is that something that, that NYSERDA does? Um, and do I know if, I, I guess I could ask utilities if they'll come so out and do an audit. Um, yeah, you, know, you have to hire a private contractor that's NYSERDA certified. Okay. Nice sort of approved, uh, and uh, yeah, they'll they'll come and do the audit. They'll do the you know 
check out everything and give you a, a written report that you can work off of. Okay. I, so I actually you... had uh, an audit, energy audit done by Con Ed when they were doing it, which was what, 12 years ago or whatever. And I have to tell you, it was, it was fantastic. Um, they, they found little cracks actually in, in cabinets in my kitchen that I never even thought about. And of course, around my fireplace. I mean, it was an incredible audit. Um, and I did some things. I, I redid my whole basement. I still need to do my attic, though. So, uh, I had too much stuff in my attic to, <laughs> to, <laughs> to determine to go in that direction. But I need to do that. So it was wonderful. And I, I would think if it's $250, it's probably well worth it to, to uh, you know, have, have an audit done. So. Yeah, and the assessment can be done now through this nice sort of program. You can call Sustainable Westchester. We have a list of contractors that we recommend. The contractors are participating in the nice sort of program, and they'll do everything um, similar to what you were describing, Sandy. They're looking for those cracks and those leaks, mm -hmm. and um, yeah. But you don't know the air is just that hot air is just going out. Um, R E N Z Renz. You have a question? Hi, this is Renee. I just oh, Renee. had a question okay. regarding um, I'm in Peekskill, wondering if there are any programs for rebates if you decide that you do want to put solar on your roof. Are there any statewide or other programs? Do we? Can you uh, hear me, Scott? Yes, we do. Scott. Yeah, other than the CF Joe. Lauren wanted to jump in, but there is a, a New York Sun program that, that NYSERDA runs that um, the incentives go to a contractor, so you work with a contractor, um, and um, you know, depending on where you're located and what your project is, will determine you know, what what kind of incentives are, are available. Um, so you can find if you you can go to our website and find a solar contractor that's participating, and they okay. can walk you through what's available. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. And I would just uh, add that um, if you get an estimate from a solar installer, um, they'll let you know what you're entitled to as well. Um, they, they should document that on the estimate, uh, and including a federal tax credit uh, in addition to the state uh, incentives, okay. uh, which yep. are, and they're, they're quite generous. I mean, solar is very expensive to begin with, so you, you still wind up paying a lot of money, but it certainly makes it much more doable from many people yeah joe okay. thanks i should have mentioned so there's federal federal tax credits state tax credits and an incentive um from NYSERDA for most for most projects okay great and i can find all that on NYSERDA what's the website NYSERDA.com or gov uh, it's NYSERDA.ny.gov um or you can google new york sun um but again i think you know, you, your the program the, the the program is for the contract. Like the our funding goes through the contractor. So as oh, Joe, I see. yeah. So as Joe was saying, if you you know if, if contact a contractor, you want to just make sure that they're participating in the program. Uh, but then if they are, then they'll then they'll when they give you their proposal, they'll package all that up for you and they'll say, you know, this is your federal tax credit, this is your state tax credit, this is your this is your New York Sun incentive, and they'll sort of show that in the in the in the final pricing. Okay, thank you. And if anybody has any problems, just call my office too. We'll, we'll try to help. Uh, Lynn, I don't. Hi, hi. <laughs> thank you, Sandy, for having this uh, forum. And I'd like to thank everybody that came in. I, I have a question. I'm interested. I already know I have leaks in my home. And um, I, I was interested in the cellulose um, uh, insulation. But when they come, it, does that contractor have to take down walls in order? I mean, I, I know that this this is an old home. So what exactly am I going to be looking at? Can they blow it in through a hole in the wall or do they have to take down walls? Am I going to almost essentially be building a new house? No, uh, no, you shouldn't. Um, but, you know, the answer is it depends on your house and what it's made of, what kind of construction it is. Like a brick wall obviously would be more difficult to work with than um, a wood frame house with, um, you know, vinyl or aluminum siding. Um, 
But no, they basically um, remove the siding from the outside, obviously, and uh, drill a hole about two inches in diameter, and they pump the insulation in under pressure. Uh, they have to do that about, depending on the house construction, every 16 or 24 inches, depending on you know your stud uh, width. Mm -hmm. um, then they plug that hole and they replace the siding. Um, that's how it happens in general. Oh, uh, there we go. I'm guessing Lauren just threw that slide up there. Um, there you go. You can see an example of, of how it's done. There's the, you know, the holes uh, and they've already been filled, it looks like, um, and they'll be plugged in that site and replaced. But again, it depends on your house and a contractor could tell you, you know, just how invasive the process might or non-invasive the process might be. Right. And, and Doug, just... Well, I'm pretty sure. Uh, well, my house is a um, vinyl siding, so it would look like that. Um, and this, and the um, the the roof. Um, I'm sorry, the attic. Um, it's finished. So would they have to? Would that be the same process inside? You know, That's drilling the holes. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Does anybody know? It just depends work? on. Like, do you have? When you have the contractor come out, you have a choice if you wanted to do spray foam on the ceiling of the attic or if you wanted to do the dense pack or the cellulose on the floor of the attic. Like Sandy was saying, she had too much stuff in her attic, so they couldn't do it. So that's something to consider. Uh, and a lot of people run into that because they do need space to put the cellulose on the floor of the attic. But another choice could be they encapsulate with foam on the yeah, on the ceiling. But, so. but it, with a finished attic, that's a little bit trickier. I think. Oh, saying finished. Attic is finished. Yes. finished. So, so in that case, uh, it can be blown in through the walls. And just like you saw the outside picture, those cavities can be filled. The only thing is after they drill the holes, you'll have to repaint. So sometimes. Oh, they would, they would drill holes on the inside and treat it the way they would treat the outside. Yeah, because they're filling, um, right. they're just filling the cavities. And the hole is not large, maybe like five inches. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that, that wouldn't really take a lot to, to finish that way. But, but what would cost is putting up the new siding. And they don't supply that. It and should not be new siding, though. So if it's yeah, plastic siding, it. just comes out and they put it right back in like a puzzle. Oh, thing. OK. Yeah. All right. So they don't yeah. ruin that. OK. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, yeah. I actually had I had vinyl siding also. And I, I had my my walls insulated with that same method. And you, you couldn't tell when they were done. You could not tell at all. How much did it run you about? Uh, well, that's uh, a complicated question because I had a lot of work done. Um, but just for the, I had, the cellulose, I, I didn't, well, I had my attic done. I had my walls done. I had everything sealed. I'm trying to think of what other work they might've done. They also did my basement. Um, and I think after all was said and done, it was about $12,000. Mm -hmm. I have a small house. It, you know, depends on the size of your house too. I have a small home and I'm pretty sure okay. that nobody's coming out for less than ten thousand dollars no matter yeah. what no and yeah. that was that was seven years ago <laughs> all right that, that too um one yeah. one quick question i don't know if this is a possibility but i remember um you were saying that um lauren was saying that she got a check back when she she came off the grid i guess um a couple of times during the year and and does coming off the grid include using a generator? So for the program grid rewards is all about the electricity grid and your impact on it. But the way that you would reduce your impact would be to raise your thermostat a few degrees or turn off your air conditioning, unplug devices, nothing major. Um, some people even like pre-cool their homes. They know the demand response event will be like four to six. So they can make their house pre-cooled. So it's summer day from two to four, and then they turn off their AC during that time. Um, so nothing, nothing crazy, just right. a little reduction. 
And and not a generator, as you were asking. Right. Yeah, not a generator, just turning things off. Uh -huh. yep. Okay. Yeah, it's now, kind of like using time of day, isn't it? Right. In a way, when you use your electricity. Kind of like that, but not everybody has that time of use rate anyway. But that's getting right. at the same conservation principles. Right. Okay. And, and that's I, not available in Putnam. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, it should be really soon if Joe gets to work in Putnam. <laughs> <laughs> Is it available in Westchester? It's only available in Con Ed territory in New York City and Westchester. Yeah. Oh, it is available. I didn't know it was available in Westchester. Okay. Yep. New Westchester Con Ed. Yep. Right. All right. I, I would, this has just been such a wonderful, informative, uh, exciting uh, program and so much for us to think about. And I, and I like the idea that we should start to plan ahead of. Uh, our, our appliances falling apart and <laughs> our furnaces and everything else to really go out there and look to see what what is available. So I just really want to thank Scott and Lauren and Claire and Joe because it was just it was just a packed show uh, with great things. So I think we should all unmute and clap for all of them. <laughs> and And thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and we will collect any, you know, just call my office 914-941-1111. Uh, Claire Wexted is on right there. Well, she's in my right hand side there. Um, and she will, you know, send out any information that you need. And we will, we will have it up. In fact, if you're on our e-blast, uh, or if you're not, why don't you get on our e-blast so we can send you the information about it uh, or just call the office. And uh, But it will be up on YouTube. We'll try to get it up. It'll be next week, right, Claire? Probably next week. Yes, definitely next week. Okay. All right. Um, so I just want to thank all of you for participating and our wonderful speakers. Um, I would just you know, just did such a great job of educating us. So thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Bye Thank you, Assembly Woman. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Fabulous. everybody. Rest Bye. of the weekend. Mm -hmm. Happy energy savings. <laughs> <laughs> Give energy all weekend. <laughs>